From the site of Noah's Ark to the depths of the Red Sea, the grandeur of Mount Sinai and the ash ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah, these and other new surprising discoveries are brought to life in this series by international explorer, archaeologist and author Jonathan Gray. Well, here we are at Saqqara, on the edge of the great desert west of the Nile. Saqqara is the uh, oldest pyramid in Egypt. And uh, it is quite a unique site. There's nothing like it in the whole country. As a matter of fact, the administrative complex that we've uh, come to see here today includes uh, great holes in the ground which we believe to be storage bins from a biblical event, the time of Joseph when there was a seven year famine preceded by seven years of plenty. And today we are here to show you uh, some of the remains which are quite astonishing in relation to an event which we believe is very highly biblical. We trudged over the scorched sand of the desert amid Egypt's oldest ruins. Through the friendly influence of Dr. Ali Hassan, Egyptian Director of Antiquities, my wife Josephine and I were now to descend into tunnels far beneath the earth. We had first to break wax seals on two doors. Soon we were in ancient chambers, 110 feet under the desert. The walls were lined with shimmering blue tiles. Sadly, salt crystals have begun to invade the ancient walls. Salt was attacking many of the old stone monuments of Egypt, and this tunnel system was not escaping that destruction. We wondered, who used these tunnels 4,000 years ago. Why were they constructed? Egypt boasts a glorious past. Some 900 miles upstream from the mouth of the Nile sits Abu Simbel. Perhaps nowhere else in Egypt, perhaps nowhere else in the world, is there anything like Abu Simbel. In the 13th century BC, on the banks of the Nile, Ramesses II commanded his architects to build two magnificent temples from adjacent pinkish sandstone cliffs. The work is said to have taken up to 15 years. An artist of the National Geographic Society tries to capture the event. In one cliff, Ramesses carved out a jewel-like temple dedicated to his beautiful wife, Nefertari. In another cliff, just 100 steps distant, workmen smoothed away the surface to a height of 110 feet and there carved four colossal 67-foot figures, all seated, all alike, of Ramesses himself. Each would weigh 1,200 tons. Tunneling 200 feet inside the cliff, the builders then hollowed out great halls. Chamber after chamber they adorned with carvings of great beauty. Here the ideals of Egyptian sculpture, grandeur and solemnity are carried to perfection. One may imagine the pomp that attended the dedication of this temple the beat of drums, the blast of trumpets, and the clanging of other musical instruments as the monarch and his queen led the procession, followed by the priest. Right. For a while after Ramesses' death, the priests continued to maintain the temples. But by 1000 BC, Lower Nubia had begun to fade from the pages of history 
and the sands of the western desert started to invade the great temple. Abu Simbel had obviously been forgotten by classical times, else it would surely have been listed as one of the seven wonders of the world. In 668 BC, two Greek mercenaries climbed the sand hills to carve their names on the statues. In 1813, 2,500 years later, Swiss traveller John Burkett travelled far up the Nile and stumbled upon this remote spot. He gasped as he saw the tops of four immense statues poking out of the sand. In 1817, Giannavi Balzani, an Italian who disguised himself as an Arab, penetrated the sand barrier. He went in with torches. Eventually much of the sand was cleared away from the front, outside. In the 1870s, Amelia Edwards visited and wrote about her visit. Inside is a dim chamber where two lines of towering figures of the pharaoh as Osiris confront one another across a central aisle. Still deeper and much darker is the inner shrine where the king sits side by side with the supreme gods, Amon, Horus and Ta. At any time, Abu Simbel is an awesome sight, but at the moment of dawn, it is incredible. When the rising sun tops the mountains across the river and flashes full on the facade, the figure of the sun god seems animated by the sudden light, as though to step forward to greet the morning. First rays briefly shine through the entry, penetrating the darkness to strike the four gloomy deities 180 feet within the bowels of the mountain. Ramesses is one famous name from ancient Egypt. Another is Tutankhamun, who was buried in a six million dollar coffin. However, Tutankhamun is famous for the reason that his was the only unspoiled grave found in our time. While other tombs had been robbed long ago, Tutankhamun's tomb was hidden by rubble. It was discovered in 1922. Despite the unbelievable wealth found stored in his tomb, Tutankhamun was really a comparatively minor personage in ancient Egyptian history. However, in the Third Dynasty, there does appear a most incredible individual in the ancient records, a man called Imhotep. Our archaeological team in Egypt has come face to face with many surprises. Among the most amazing of them all is this man, Imhotep. The story of Imhotep uncannily parallels the story of the biblical Joseph. Of course, scholars have claimed that there is no evidence that the biblical stories actually occurred that there is no evidence that the ancestors of the Jews ever lived in Egypt, or that Joseph ever lived. However, I shall share with you an astonishing story. I have called it In a Coffin in Egypt. For many years, Egyptologists had even doubted that Imhotep had been a real person. They found it difficult to believe the various accomplishments credited to him. Imhotep has been termed the Leonardo da Vinci of ancient Egypt, but he was more than that. Da Vinci gained the reputation of a genius. Imhotep was eventually elevated to the status of a god. The historian Manetho wrote that during his reign, that is, the reign of Zosa of the Third Dynasty lived Imothes, that is, Imhotep, who, because of his medical skill, has the reputation of Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine among the Egyptians, 
and who was also the inventor of the art of building with hewn stone. Now, it is this statement that caused specialists to doubt the existence of a real man named in Hotep. But in 1926, the question was settled once and for all. Imhotep was a real man. When excavations were carried out at the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara, south of Cairo, fragments of a statue of Pharaoh Zosa were found. The base of the statue was inscribed with the names of Zosa and of Imhotep, Chancellor of the King of Lower Egypt, Chief under the King, Administrator of the Great Palace, Hereditary Lord, High Priest of Heliopolis, Imhotep the Builder, the Sculptor, the Maker of Stone Vases. Is this an echo of the Biblical Joseph? Notice how the Bible describes his high rank under the Pharaoh. Thou shalt be over my house, and according to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, Bow the knee! And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. It sounds as if Joseph was the first person ever given such an honour by a pharaoh. Anyway, who was this Joseph? Joseph is perhaps the best known to readers of the Bible epic as that young Hebrew lad whose father made for him a multicoloured coat. He was one of twelve brothers. The elder brothers had long hated Joseph because he was their father's favourite, you could say. To make it worse, Joseph told his brothers of some dreams he had had. Listen to this dream, said Joseph. We were binding sheaves of corn, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood around and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers retorted, Shall you really reign over us? And they hated him more for his dreams and his words. And Joseph related yet another dream to them. Look, the sun and the moon, our dad and mum, and eleven stars, you, my brothers, bowed down to me. Now the time came when Jacob sent his son Joseph to visit his ten elder brothers who were away tending their father's flocks. The brothers conspired to get rid of Joseph. They first tossed him into a dry pit, and later, however, took him out and sold him to some passing merchants who were en route to Egypt. The brothers then dipped Joseph's coat in animal blood and reported to the old father that his son must have been killed by a wild animal. Meanwhile, Joseph was dragged to Egypt. In Egypt, Joseph was sold to a man named Potiphar, captain of the Pharaoh's guard. This man grew to admire Joseph. When, however, Joseph resisted the advances of Potiphar's wife, she accused him of a sexual attack, and Joseph ended up in prison. It was while in prison that Joseph shared time with a butler and a baker, both of whom had been in the service of the king. On the same night, both men had dreams, which Joseph interpreted, informing the butler that he would be restored to royal favour, but that the baker was to die. And this is what actually happened. Meanwhile, Joseph remained in prison, forgotten. It occurred that some time later, when the king himself had a dream, which greatly troubled him, the butler remembered Joseph and told the Pharaoh. Joseph was summoned from the prison and brought into the king's presence where he was asked to interpret the king's dream. Joseph informed the king that there were to come upon Egypt seven years of prosperity followed by a seven-year famine. 
Joseph gave credit to God for this information, and he suggested to the Pharaoh how to prepare for the famine. The Pharaoh was so impressed by Joseph's wisdom that he not only liberated this foreigner, but installed him in a position of influence. Joseph's main position was that of a prime minister, and Imhotep appears to be the first who could boast of such a broad range of authority in the ancient Egyptian records. There are records of many, many viziers throughout Egyptian history. But the first evidence which connects Imhotep with Joseph is an amazing inscription found carved on a large rock on the island of Sahil, just below the first cataract of the Nile River. The inscription claims to be a copy of a document written by Zosa in the 18th year of his reign this copy being written over 1,000 years after the events it claims to be relating. It goes on to tell of a seven-year famine and seven years of plenty. And here we have an inscription which tells a story of Pharaoh Zosa asking his vizier Imhotep to help him with the problem of a seven-year famine. Imhotep tells him he must consult the god because the answer is not in him. Then the pharaoh dreams a dream which foretells the event. Next follow seven years of plenty, which is reversed from the biblical account. The pharaoh levies a tax on all of the population except the priesthood. Now all of the components of the biblical account are present in this inscription except that the story has been Egyptianized to fit their religious beliefs. In the early 1980s, my friend Ron Wyatt was shown the tombs of two officials from the reign of the pharaoh Zosa, and the inscriptions of the officials both state that they collected grain for a seven-year famine. But by the mid-80s, both of these tombs were closed. The name Imhotep in ancient Egyptian is translated to mean the voice or mouth of Im. However, there is no record of a god in Egypt called Im. But in the ancient scriptures is the god I am. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. God told Moses, Tell the Pharaoh that I am has sent you. It appears that the I am was the name by which the Egyptians had known Joseph's God. Could Im have been I am? The name that the Bible says was given to Joseph by the Pharaoh that's Zaphonath Penia, has been translated by some to mean the God lives, the God speaks. Now, since we do not fully understand the meaning of the Egyptian Hotep, it's quite possible that the translation of Imhotep, the voice of I am, is identical to the biblical name of Joseph. The God lives, the God speaks. Imhotep is the earliest physician whose historical records survive. And although Joseph isn't mentioned as being a physician, the Bible does give one very important clue to this. But, and Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father, and they embalmed Israel. Now here the physicians are specifically stated to be under Joseph. But later, when Imhotep became established as the god of healing, it is the manner in which he healed that ties him directly to Joseph. Ancient Greek writings mention a great sanctuary at Memphis where people came from everywhere to seek cures from Imhotep. They would pray to him, make offerings, and then spend the night in this sanctuary, which was a sort of Lourdes of ancient Egypt. And while sleeping, the god Imhotep was said to come to people in their dreams and cure them. 
Is there a connection between Joseph and dreams? Remember, it was Joseph's dream about him and his brothers binding sheaves that was one of the causes of their great jealousy of him. After he related to them that he had dreamt their sheaves stood up and bowed to his. And uh, his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Come now, therefore, they said, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. In the records, Imhotep was associated with doing good by dreams. So was Joseph. The biblical account also speaks of Joseph's wisdom. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Again the evidence points to Imhotep. Imhotep was also revered for his wisdom. In several inscriptions from which later times reference is made to the words of Imhotep. For example, in Song from the Tomb of King Intef, we read, I have heard the words of Imhotep and Hardifa, and it goes on to explain that their sayings were recited in his day. Now I wonder, could it be that after Joseph's death, others copied his wise sayings and took credit for them, perhaps editing a bit of their own and changing things to suit them? As these sayings were passed down through several generations, instead of being attributed to Imhotep, they were attributed to Tarhotep, the voice of the Egyptian creator, Tar. These writings do show a link to Joseph. At the end of these Egyptian manuscripts, the writer states that he is near death, having lived 110 years and that he received honours from the king exceeding those of his ancestors. In other words, he received the most honours ever given a man by a pharaoh. And he died at 110. Now notice the Bible concerning Joseph. And Joseph lived 110 years old. Standard practice was for the pharaoh always to appoint men to office as soon as he took the throne, with family members being the highest ranked. Imhotep was not Zosa's vizier earlier in his reign. In fact, no mention is made at all of Imhotep on Zosa's earlier monuments. The architect of Zosa's tomb, built at Beit Caliph, which was probably undertaken soon after he became king, was not Imhotep. In this earlier tomb, which is similar to those of preceding dynasties, there are clay ceilings of jars which record Zosa's name, his mother's name, and the names of numerous other officials from his reign, but not Imhotep's, which indicates that Imhotep had not yet been appointed to this position. In some inscriptions, his titles indicate that he was not a member of the royal family, but a self-made man. All available information about Imhotep continues to point to his identification with Joseph. Imhotep was also priest of Heliopolis, the biblical On. Now, in the story of Joseph, we learn that his father-in-law was the priest of On at the time of Joseph's marriage. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath Paniah, and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. 
The original reading of this text is not priest of On, but prince of On. Joseph married the daughter of the prince of On. The town of Medinet El Fayum, 80 miles, 128 kilometers, south of Cairo, in the middle of the fertile Fayum oasis, is extolled as the Venice of Egypt. In its lush gardens grow oranges, mandarins, peaches, olives, pomegranates, and grapes. Bayon owes these delicious fruits to the artificial canal over 200 miles, that's 320 kilometres long, which brings in Nile water and turns this region, otherwise desert, into a paradise. This canal ran parallel to the Nile, northward, to permit the floodwaters of the Nile to flow into a natural basin. When the flood state was passed, the impounded waters could be returned to the Nile by means of a second, shorter canal. Examination of the remnants of this system indicates that it could well have doubled the tillable soil of the Nile Valley through which it passed. The ancient canal is called by the Fellahin, that's the farmers, Bar Yusuf, Joseph's Canal. It is known by this name throughout Egypt. It is so named on the modern maps. The farmers say that it was the Joseph of the Bible, Pharaoh's Grand Vizier, who planned it. During the seven years of plenty, Egypt was able to prepare extra grain, which was harvested and placed in enormous grain pits, specially dug below the ground level. Later, during the seven-year famine, food seekers converged on Egypt to purchase supplies. It was Imhotep who is credited with having designed the first pyramid and building in hewn stone instead of all mud brick. If we look closely at ancient Egypt in its history, we can see evidence that it was during the time of Zosa that Egypt became a truly great nation. After all, it had gathered the wealth of all the surrounding nations by selling them grain during the famine. And during the seven years of plenty, the people, under Joseph's wise guidance, began to organise a great administrative centre which would handle the selling of the grain to all the surrounding nations. A large complex was built which contained the future burial site of the pharaoh, but also included a walled-in center which contained huge grain pits. The Saqqara complex was part of the sprawling metropolis of Memphis, the royal capital. It contained what is today termed the Step Pyramid. Surrounding the Step Pyramid and its complex is a very beautiful and elaborate wall. At the main entrance on the east wall, at the southern end, one enters a long hall of 40 columns, that's 20 on each side. Each column is shaped as a cob of corn and the individual segments of golden coloured corn can be seen. This hints at the purpose of the building.
Each column is connected to the main wall by a perpendicular wall, forming small rooms between each column. As you exit this colonnade and walk straight ahead, you come to a series of very large pits which extend deep into the earth. These are extremely large in size, much larger than any burial chambers. Walking past one of the pits, I asked a guide, what do you think this is? He replied, oh, that was a tomb to bury someone in. However, I shall tell you now that they are all centrally accessible by a connecting tunnel and they extend to well above ground level also. And one has a staircase extending down to the bottom. For this reason we know that they were not built as tombs. If they were, they would have been constructed underground and they certainly would not have been so incredibly large. These massive structures extend to well above ground level, which indicates that they were not hidden as were tombs. Because the ancient Egyptians buried their dead with so much valuable material and provisions for their afterlife, plundering of tombs was always their biggest fear. Therefore we know that these massive pits had another purpose. Also in all the cities of other ancient civilizations, whenever large bins such as these were uncovered, they were recognized as storage bins. But in Egypt, the scholars tend to term everything they find a tomb. However, in the pharaoh's burial complex under the pyramid, we find matching bins for the king's and his family's afterlife, and in these bins were found grain and other foodstuffs. In the biblical account, we learn that Joseph appointed men throughout the land of Egypt to oversee the gathering and storing of the grain in all the cities during the seven years of plenty. Later, during the famine, he gave the orders for the distribution of the grain. And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. But when foreigners came to purchase grain, they went to Joseph, the governor. When Joseph's brothers came to Egypt to buy grain, they would eventually find themselves bowing to Joseph. We believe it is Saqqara to which they came, where the remains of this fantastic complex are preserved, and it was here that Pharaoh Zosa had 11 extremely large pits constructed, which can only be grain stored in storage bins. Every city had stored grain from its region, but at this complex at Saqqara we have these massive pits which would have stored an incredible amount of grain, more than a single city would ever have needed. And uh, at the entrance to the complex, as we described earlier, there are 40 small cubicles, each just the right size, to hold a single person who could administer the receipt of payment from people coming to purchase the grain. They would then have received their bags of grain. The design of the pits is impressive. There are 11 of them with only one containing a very elaborate stairway extending all the way to the bottom. All the pits are connected to each other by a subterranean tunnel. The pits were filled and the tops were sealed with wooden timbers and stone and all of the grain could be accessed from one entrance. And there is one entrance into the pits from outside the wall enclosure of the complex. And did you know, grain was found in the floor of these pits. The complex at Saqqara is unique. Nothing like it has ever been found. A great deal has been written about this complex 
and most mention the uniqueness of it, something they cannot explain. I suggest to you that the circumstantial evidence fits the story of Joseph perfectly. We know from the biblical account that Joseph died in Egypt and was embalmed and placed in a coffin. It says, So Joseph died, being an hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. In a coffin in Egypt. But when the children of Israel left Egypt some two centuries later, at the time of the Exodus, Joseph's bones were taken with them. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he, Joseph, had straightly sworn to the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. One of the big mysteries for Egyptologists has been the tomb of Imhotep. They simply cannot find it, although they know it should be somewhere in Saqqara. In the guidebook to Saqqara by Jill Camel, the tomb of Imhotep is listed as a subject heading, only to explain that it has not been found. Now, suppose that Imhotep was Joseph, and if Joseph's body was taken away, could it be that his tomb was possibly taken over and used by someone else, and would this not wipe out the original identity of the tomb from being that of Imhotep? Ancient Greek texts spoke of a place near Memphis where people came to worship Imhotep and be healed. Excavators at Saqqara, working very near the Steppe Pyramid, have found an incredible labyrinth of underground tunnels. These were full of mummified ibis and bulls. Over the centuries, great waves of sand had swept in from the Sahara Desert and completely covered the area, until in 1850, French archaeologist Mariette discover the place where the sacred bulls were buried. The wind blowing over the shifting sand had exposed a small opening. The bulls were in coffins of solid granite, polished as smooth as glass. Their average weight is 150 tons. The Egyptians, of course, were pagans who worshipped many different animals as gods. Inscriptions and coins found here show that people came here to be healed. What had just been found then was the famous sanctuary to Imhotep, written by, by the Greeks. After the deification of Imhotep by the Egyptians as god of medicine, he was given the title chief one of the Ibis, and this was the connection of this labyrinth with Imhotep. The hundreds of thousands of ibis that were mummified and brought here were a tribute to none other than Imhotep filling these tunnels. These galleries, it was later found, were connected to a pit, and the pit extended down to a funerary chamber which contained an empty coffin. The chamber belonged to a large mastaba tomb. And in the tomb's storerooms were jars whose clay stoppers had the seal impression of Pharaoh Zosa. Well, here is absolute proof that this was the tomb of a very important person of Zosa's reign. No inscriptions were found on the walls and the sarcophagus was empty. But even more importantly, this mastaba is orientated to the north instead of to the east as the other pyramids are. This was an important tomb of someone from Zosa's time, but the sarcophagus was empty, and it had titles applicable to Joseph.
on it. There was even found an inscription by an anonymous Greek who came here telling how he was cured, and it was through a dream. Once again, the evidence speaks loudly of a wonderful story from the Bible, the story of Joseph. The Pyramid of Tito, first king of Dynasty VI, is called by the local populace the Prison Pyramid. Local tradition says that it was built near the ruins of the prison where Joseph was confined. The pyramid is located near Saqqara in a likely area for such imprisonment. Joseph the dreamer saved Egypt by a prophecy which he claimed was from God. That prophecy was very specific. Did you know the Bible contains some 1,000 prophecies, some concerning Egypt, which reach thousands of years into the future, even to our day? Of course, we humans can be sure of nothing, even seconds ahead, isn't that right? Just ask any horse punter. You may have heard of the wealthy King Croesus who went to visit the Oracle of Delphi. He wanted to know whether he should fight the Persians. The wise Oracle told him that by crossing the river Halus, Croesus will destroy a mighty power. Well, Croesus took this as a prophecy that he would destroy the great Persian army. So he went into battle, but he was defeated. Yes, he did destroy a mighty power, his own. Whichever way the battle went, the augury would be true. Human prophecy, I've found, is much like that. But here is something different. The Bible writers throw out a challenge to us. They have written, If you want to know whether the Bible came out of the fertile minds of men, or whether it was dictated to man by God, there is an acid test you can apply. That test is biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy is as far from human prediction as midday is from midnight. You see, Bible prophecies are specific. So that you will know I am God comes the challenge. I am going to give you the game plan of history before it happens. You test it. And then he proceeds to give us a thousand or more predictive prophecies, dealing not merely with broad general outlines, but often with minute details. Centuries pass. Suddenly events start happening, and a great variety of predictions, highly improbable when given, are progressively fulfilled. We all know that no man can predict world history. We can only guess. So when we find a series of predictions, and they do take place precisely as foretold, could this be proof of a non-human source of information? I suggest to you that prophecy establishes the fact of a divine intellect behind the Bible. It establishes the fact of God. Joseph and other biblical prophets received messages through dreams or visions. Here is one such prophecy concerning the city of Memphis, capital of Lower Egypt. Noth, that's Memphis, shall be waste and desolate without an inhabitant. Memphis was a sprawling city of temples, palaces and pyramids. It stretched for 25 miles, that's 40 kilometres, from Abu Roash in the north to Dasha in the south. But today, and this is all that remains of Memphis, eldest of cities, a few rubbish heaps, a dozen or so of broken statues, and the name. Where are the stately ruins that even in the Middle Ages extended over a space estimated at half a day's journey in every direction? One can hardly believe that a great city ever flourished on this spot or understand how it should have been effaced so utterly. 
so completely destroyed was the city that its site was long a subject of dispute. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols, and I will cause their images to cease out of Noph, Memphis. Now Memphis was known as the great temple city of Egypt. A more unlikely fate could hardly be imagined than the destruction of the idols and images of Memphis. Because uh, firstly, the uh, climate of Egypt, where it never rains, keeps in a state of pre perfect preservation for thousands of years whatever is buried in its soil. Uh, secondly, in other cities of Egypt, whether in ruins or now flourishing, idols and images are found in superabundance. For example, in Thebes, former capital of Egypt, though already in ruins while Memphis was still in splendour, has idols in abundance. And in other Egyptian cities equally old, time has not destroyed the images and idols. Yes, idols are still found elsewhere, but the prophecy said, not in Memphis. 1800 years after this prophecy, the idols of Memphis were still there. A few years ago, in one of the great desert mounds, the heart of Memphis was rediscovered, and the archaeologists were amazed at something. There was one thing missing from this centre of idolatry and idol worship. There were no more images, no more idols. One archaeologist wrote, What has happened to them we do not know. What strange circumstance could have taken them away? As one walks over miles of scorched sand where Memphis once proudly stood, it is obvious that every word of that Bible prediction has come true. Now here is another prophecy, this time concerning Thebes. No, that's Thebes, shall be rent asunder, said the prophecy. I will cut off the multitude of Thebes. In 525 BC, Cambyses the Persian attacked and burnt Thebes, but it was rebuilt. The second blow was struck by the grandfather of Cleopatra, but the city was so strong it held out against his army for three years. Then, as was prophesied, the multitude were cut off and never returned. Now the prophecy did not say that Thebes would disappear, but that it would be broken up. Here today are seen the most remarkable ruins. Its temples and palaces are broken up. But more than that, Thebes itself is rent asunder into nine hamlets. Two of these are the famous Karnak and Luxor. In Karnak, the temple of Amun, as it stands today, is over one-fifth of a mile long. The entire Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris could fit within one of its halls. Yes, true to the prophecy, Thebes still exists, but in a broken-up condition, just as the prophet said it would. Another prophecy speaks of the papyrus plant. Said Isaiah, the reeds and flags shall wither, the paper reeds by the brooks shall wither, be driven away, and be no more. The Egyptians are said to be the first of all people to manufacture and use writing paper made from a reed which grew in abundance along the marshes of the Nile. From papyrus comes the word paper. It was used for writing materials as well as for the wrappings of mummies. This reed is the papyrus antiquorum. It was also known as bulrushes. The ark in which the baby Moses was hid was made of this. 
In Egypt, ships made of papyrus reeds woven and lashed together plied the Nile. The fan-shaped head of papyrus appeared in Egyptian design as a symbol of Lower Egypt. It was while the papyrus reeds were still growing luxuriantly along the Nile Delta that this significant Bible prophecy was addressed to Egypt. True to this prediction, the plant has long since entirely disappeared from its former haunts in Egypt. Although it still grows in Sicily, near Haifa in Israel and in certain parts of interior Africa, the closest to Lower Egypt being as far as 600 miles upstream. Our things are in our, this green leaves, it is used in Champagne to make sandals, shoes, and make a basket. But the most important the inner, what we use to make paper. We put it in the water here, six days because it has 20% sugar, 10% only out in these six days, and each part hour we change the water. After six days, what a dish like that, and we hammer it like that here. After, after we hammer it, we roll it to make it a flat and small, like that, and squeeze the water. After we have it, roll it is come flat and small, like this. We get the other piece do the same way, and I put it different direction, this side, and this side like a wee bit, up, down, up, down, let's see. After that, we put it under press, six days more under press, like that here. We start to stick together, no glue. Why is sticking together? Because the tender center is sugar. That's why we leave it, like a glue. So, after 12 days, 6 days in the water, 6 days under the bed, we got a piece of paper like that. If you see the structure here, see the wave it here, after 12 days. After we give it to Academy of Art in Cairo, take it and move to original places like museum, temples, tombs, and the paint was so exactly from original. By stone coral, like lavish leathery turquoise, onyx, mica powder, of natural stone, and use with it, and the gold come from eating crab gold drinking. This is the light, this is the gold how it looks like. See here? I should mention that a clump of papyrus has been planted in a plot in front of the Cairo Museum. A museum piece, but it is no longer growing wild throughout Egypt. And there shall be no more a prince of the land of Egypt. When recorded, this prophecy seemed a wild and absurd statement. Egypt was a mighty nation. She had a line of kings such as no other nation of the world had ever possessed, and it seemed as though this would last forever. Even today, Egypt has had a longer line of kings than any other country under heaven. Yet, since 400 BC, that's for 2,400 years, none of Egypt's kings has been an Egyptian. The land of the pharaohs has been ruled by foreign overlords, Persians, then Greeks, Romans, Saracens, Turks, and then more, the French, British, and Arabs. Will you ask, what about King Farouk, who ruled as the last king of Egypt until World War II? Yes, Farouk was the last of the line of princes, but did you know he was not an Egyptian, but Albanian? Naguib, the man who led the revolt to depose Farouk, he was not an Egyptian, but Sudanese. 
Presidents Nasser, Mubarak, Sadat, and so on, none of them have been Egyptian, but of Arab descent. Never in world history has any nation been subject to foreign governments and foreign rule so long as Egypt has been. One is reminded of the prophecy, I will make the land desolate and all that is therein by the hand of strangers. I, the Lord, have spoken it. I tell you, Bible prophecy is very accurate. Today, Egypt, although the most heavily populated nation in the Middle East, is populated mainly by Arabs, not Egyptians. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, the Copts in Egypt, not the Arabs, are the racial representatives of the ancient Egyptians. The Copts have undoubtedly preserved the race of the Egyptians as it existed at the time of the Arab conquest in remarkable purity. The Copts are direct descendants from the ancient Egyptians. The Coptic language is at base ancient Egyptian. Many of the nouns and verbs found in the hieroglyphic texts remain unchanged in the Coptics. You'll notice God said he would diminish the Egyptians, not the Arabs who later invaded the country. There are seven times fewer Egyptians today than when this curse was pronounced. Only one out of every four, 24 inhabitants of Egypt is a true Egyptian. The rest are Arabs. In their own country, the descendants of the ancient Egyptians are outnumbered 23 to 1 by Arab foreigners who have come in and taken over the country. Egypt unlike other kingdoms of the Middle East, is not predicted to be destroyed and obliterated, but will suffer continual baseness and decline. While prophecy, in speaking of other kingdoms of the Middle East, predicted their destruction and obliteration, of Egypt it is predicted that she will remain but decline. They shall no more rule over the nations. It shall be the basest, that is, the lowliest of the kingdoms. Now, when this prophecy was made about 600 BC, the people of that day knew Egypt as the granary of the world eminent in science, in the arts, in luxury and magnificence, the leader of civilization. When all other men would have predicted unending prosperity, the biblical prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel foretold the opposite. Rome became powerful and conquered the world, including Egypt, and Rome was in turn conquered by barbarian tribes from the north. During this time, Egypt was still powerful. This prophecy could not have been the result of human foresight. Alexandria in Egypt for 600 years continued as the chief city in the Roman Empire in rank, commerce and prosperity. A hundred years later, Egypt was still so powerful that the Mohammedan hordes, though arrogant with unchecked victory, hesitated to attack Egypt. Finally, in the 7th century, they decided to attack. It took them 14 months and the lives of 23,000 men to capture Alexandria alone, and then its fall was only due to treachery. They destroyed the famous Alexandrian Library, which was a world calamity. This library supplied the Arabs with fuel for six months. They used the books as a fuel supply to heat the city's 400 public baths for six months. The prophecy said Egypt would become a base kingdom. 
Today, most of the Copts, that is the Egyptians, are low, subservient people, scribes and handcraftsmen, and in those capacities they serve the Arabs. Furthermore, Egypt as a whole has been brought down to a very low level compared to its former glory. Babylon was destroyed, Chaldea was destroyed, Assyria was destroyed, but not Egypt. Egypt was predicted to survive, but as a base nation. The filth and degradation of present-day Egypt's peoples is well known. Up to 70% can neither read nor write and are poverty-stricken. A national magazine has noted that the people of Egypt have the lowest standard of living of any nation on earth today. Here is yet another prophecy. Her cities shall be in the midst of the cities that are wasted. Cairo and Egypt's other cities today are surrounded by wasted ruins. They are in the midst of them, just as the Bible said they would be. Yet another prophecy. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. In recent times, Egypt became the vassal of several world powers, such as France and Britain. Then it fell under the influence of the Soviet Union, with whose weaponry it participated in several futile and destructive wars against Israel. However, the ancient prophet wrote, The land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Well, the land of Judah did strike terror into the Egyptian army and would have conquered and occupied Egypt except for the intervention of the United Nations in both 1967 and 1973. The remains of burnt-out Egyptian tanks still litter portions of the desert east of the Suez Canal, the Egyptian soldiers fled from the Israelis on foot. Along the Suez Canal itself, one can still see the sand battlements raised up to prevent the Israelis advancing any closer to Cairo. These prophecies have been fulfilled point by point. The scripture, evidently, cannot be broken. I believe, not because of some blind faith in an antiquated book, but because I have seen overwhelming evidence with my own two eyes. The biblical prophet Isaiah continues his prophecy, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. What is an altar? Sometimes an altar is a place of sacrifice, but an altar can also be just simply a monument. Notice this passage. Therefore, we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering, but nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you. But it is a witness between us and you. So you see, an altar can be a monument of some type. Today, there is a stepped pyramid at Saqqara. This is the remains of a very impressive complex built by the order of Zosa, a pharaoh of the third dynasty of Egypt. It was designed and built under the supervision of Imhotep. The steps were constructed of stone, which were then filled in with mud brick. Then the entire outer surface of the pyramid was finished off with a wind and waterproof layer of polished limestone, giving it the familiar pyramid shape, instead of its present stepped shape. But when the Muslims came, they continued a practice for which they were well known. They stripped this pyramid of its outer covering of smooth limestone and used it in building their mosques and other buildings, leaving the mud brick filler exposed. Because mud brick is extremely vulnerable to long-term wind and weather, this filler in time disintegrated and was dug through and tossed aside while pillagers searched for treasure. 
none was found, and the remains of these mud bricks were hauled away in the 19th and 20th centuries when this area was excavated. There are historical references to farmers hauling these mud bricks away for use as fertiliser. This left the stepped appearance that we now see, the shape of an altar similar to the ziggurats of Mesopotamia, except without steps. Joseph was obviously very close to God and acted under divine influence when he constructed this monument. Zosa may have ordered its construction to honour himself, but regardless of his motivation, in God's time it became evident as the monument it was, an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, marking the location of the grain storage bins in the land in which God provided a safe haven for Israel to grow and develop into a great nation. Now note the rest of the prophecy. In that day shall there be a pillar at the border of the land of Egypt, a pillar to the Lord. So where was the pillar at the border? King Solomon erected inscribed pillars on each side of the Red Sea crossing and built a shrine at the foot of Mount Sinai in Arabia. This was done in the 10th century BC. Ron Wyatt found them in 1978 and 1984. The pillar on the Egyptian side of the crossing site had fallen into the water when Ron found it in 1978, during the time Israel had control of the Sinai. Ron showed this to the Israeli military and they re-erected it in concrete very near where it was found which would be exactly at the border thereof, of the land of Egypt, for the Sinai Peninsula soon reverted back to Egypt. The past, the present, the future. God knows it all. He gave Joseph information that once saved Egypt. But Egypt turned its back on God and went down. God knew that, too, long before it happened. The same Creator knows the details of your life. He knows in advance all about you. That's how He knows what is best for you. He knows the solution to your problem. Why don't you give him a chance to lead you? You can trust him with confidence. She went in to get her bucket. Yeah. 
لا لا Friends, due to the exploding interest worldwide in these and other discoveries by our teams, we have prepared materials that can be shared with your friends and your neighbours. The book Dead Men's Secrets is the result of uh, up to 12 years research in over 30 countries. Surprising discoveries in lost cities of the dead. Seafloor, jungle and desert sands give up a thousand forgotten secrets. Technology that vanished. What wiped it out? Did the ancients know too much? Who mapped Australia thousands of years before Australia was discovered? The Ark Conspiracy. Cover-ups, betrayals and miracles. This is the cloak and dagger story behind the discovery of Noah's Ark in the mountains of Turkey the attempts to suppress the news, why some people reject the discovery, and the solid evidence that this may very well be the real thing. A true life thriller, archaeology at its most exciting, sting of the scorpion, astrology exposed, the truth behind star names and signs. Ancient civilizations believed that a serpent which represented the devil, took control of the world. They believed that a virgin's baby would fight the serpent, defeat him, and bring peace, life, and happiness back to mankind. The pictures on the sky map were used to describe that story, and not to tell people's fortunes through the stars. The names of the stars, as well as the star sign pictures, told that story. Curse of the Hatana Gods. This one is a stunning real life adventure. One of the most isolated islands on earth is Rotuma, ancient home to a race of giants. But Rotuma shielded a sinister secret for which there was no scientific explanation. They called it the Curse of Hatana. The evidence for the ancient giants and the incredible story of a face-to-face -face encounter with the curse is the story of this book. Sinai's Exciting Secrets. This is a compilation of information concerning the existence and discovery of the true Mount Sinai in Arabia. Do you believe in miracles? Then catch the spy story that's in this book which is probably one of the most exciting stories of the 20th century. It's in a uh, spiral-bound format with information from quite a number of sources and recent developments that have been taking place in the country as a result of the discovery. Every three months we produce a regular newsletter which goes worldwide into many countries. This uh, deals with the uh, recent developments and new materials which are continually being produced by our team, plus other significant archaeological finds around the world, 
and news of other important world developments relating to the coming new world order. If I had to recommend any particular publication, this would be it. This is the one that keeps you up to date with what is happening. We also produce spiral bound volumes of the previous issues, back issues of uh, Update International Newsletter. We at the moment have two books, uh, Back Issues Volume 1, which contains the, the first ten issues of Update International, and Back Issues Volume Number 2, which contains Update Issues 11 to 20. These cover all the discoveries in which uh, myself, Jonathan Gray, and my associates are involved with extra information, as well as ancient giants, dinosaurs, mysteries of ancient South America, surprises in the Grand Canyon, Chinese pyramids, ancient Egyptians in Australia, lost technology, and much more. Scores of photos, maps, and diagrams. And there's also an index in the second volume to all questions and topics found in both volumes. Now among the videos which we have available are the series Surprising Discoveries Numbers 1 and 2. The first video runs for two hours with three subjects. Part 1 has Noah's Ark been found, the Noah's Ark story. Part 2, Lost Secrets of the Ancients, Ancient Technology. And Part 3, Into the Forbidden Valley, Trip to Noah's Grave Site. Surprising Discoveries Number 2 runs for two and a half hours. Part 1 contains the lost cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Dead Sea Sites. Part 2, In Search of Pharaoh's Lost Army, The Red Sea Crossing. And Part 3, Smuggled Out of the Desert, the real Mount Sinai story with live footage. And finally, on the Ark of the Covenant subject, we have a book of 600 pages, which deals with uh, the subject of this video, but goes even further. When Jonathan Gray set out to prove an amateur archaeologist's claims, he never counted on being targeted for murder or facing political pressure to keep a major discovery underground. Fast-moving, spellbinding, well-documented, this book reveals forgotten voyages, secret tunnels and acts of intrigue. The CD is for computers with Macintosh and Windows. It reports on the Ark of the Covenant, but goes even further. With Noah's Ark, Sodom and Gomorrah, the Red Sea Crossing, and the Mount Sinai discoveries. In this CD, there are up to eight hours of interactive viewing, including one hour of exclusive new video footage. And it provides on the internet an international online conference for discussion and debate.